Hi, Joel. Welcome back. This is session 11, Monte Carlo inferencing. Um, we're going to talk today about another way of trying to solve um, our problems when we have these complex and intractable distributions and we don't have a way of solving them and finding analytical in an analytical way. We already discussed about variational inference and how we can transform the, the previous problem in an optimization problem through uh, the KL divergence or through uh, the mean field approximation. And in this session, we will be discussing about sampling, okay? About the, the, the first one or easiest way of performing sampling, that is the, the Monte Carlo inferencing. And the idea is really, really, really simple. Basically, what you want to do is to, um, you're interested in generating some samples, let's call them XS, from some distribution, let's say uh, PX given your data. Now, the question is, how do you do this? Um, is like how do you do these samples from this posterior, right? Um, the 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 thing is like that, that is the, the the whole idea of this chapter, right? How to construct this posterior and how to do this this sampling because once you have the sample, then um, in general, if you need some function, let's say like you need this function f, uh, what you want to do then is to compute the expectation, the expected value of f given your data. And the whole idea of the, of the Monte Carlo inference is to approximate this expectation with a weighted average of your samples such that you apply those samples to your f function. And this f function can be whatever you want. For instance, you may be trying to compute um, just the marginal of one of, the, of your samples, posterior uh, marginal, for instance, and you want to compute, for instance, one P of X I given your data. So how, like, you can just simply do that by taking the i uh, feature that you want and then just uh, doing the, the average of those posteriors. Um, you can do posteriors of difference. And you can compute, for instance, the x1 minus x2, giving you data. Uh, you can compute a posterior predictive if you want. And then you can predict, for instance, your y's, giving you data too, and so on and so forth. Any function f that you can think of, you can just apply simply through this, uh, through this method. Now, the question is, how do you perform this sample, right? And um, like the the common the most common one if you want if you want it is uh, the inverse probability transform. So uh, inverse probability transform. And the whole idea with this one is to use the CDF of your distribution and try to um, reconstruct or um, from, from like go back from a uniform distribution, right? Like from the CDF to your, to your original, original distribution. So imagine like you have one uh, X over here, right? So this is your X domain. And this is zero to one because it is the CDF, right? So you will have some monotonic increasing function here. That is your CDF. And if you remember like this, the CDF of the, of any distribution, right? Should be monotonically increasing all the way to, to one. And what you want to do is, for instance, if you're interested in some particular point over here, um, this X. So the thing is like, you know, that this X will be mapped back here to some particular value U, right? Now, the thing is that this U corresponds to the, uh, to the image of, uh, of f so if we call this big f the cdf right so this is the integral if you remember like if this is f of x this is the integral of uh p of x or well if this is f like f of x dx right from c up to x uh Okay, let's call it this x prime. So I integrate from all the way up to here, right? And I obtain that particular shape. So uh, f inverse is going to be my inverse of, of the 
of this particular CDF. That means like if I go from here to here, this X then is the inverse of U. So that is the, the really nice um, kind of a fact that we're going to exploit because now what I can do is step one, um, go and take some U, small U from a uniform between zero and one. That means like just go and sample one value from here. And once you have that U, you just need to uh, pass it to your inverse function. So you just go through the inverse U and then you obtain your X and then you're done. Basically, uh, the whole idea works because uh, the, the F inverse of U, the uniform distribution is your F. And the proof is really simple. So how do you show this? Um, if you have the probability of the inverse, F inverse of U, that is uh, less or equal to X. And this is, uh, if I apply F of X to this, to this probability over here, I end up with the probability of U less or equal to F of X, right? Because F is monotonic, so it, it, it won't change the the, uh, the the sign. And this over here is f of x, right? Because f of x should be always smaller than, than the u that I'm using. So uh, this is f of x. Since also, because uh, the probability of u of any value is that that particular value, right? And you can see it because um, my my uniform that I'm using goes from to zero from zero to one. So when you compute what is the difference, like how much it move it move with respect to some value y, right? So imagine like you have the normal one, so the probability of u less than equal to y. And what is this, right? So in general, this will be a y minus the initial interval, minus b minus a, right? But this is what? y minus zero over one minus zero, so this is y. So you have uh, your f of x over here. Now, let's see, for instance, um, some, some example of how to use this to do some, some computation. Um, one example, <coughs> Maybe, for instance, using this, uh, the exponential of x and lambda, given lambda, that is the lambda e up to minus lambda x and the indicator of x greater than or equal to zero. So in this case, <coughs> your uh, CDF will be the integral of this, right? If you integrate this, you end up with one minus e minus lambda x and the indicator of x greater than equal to zero, right? And your inverse, if you try to solve this for, for x, you end up with <coughs> inverse in here is going to be the logarithm of one minus y over lambda, right? And now it's um, it's easy to see to see this because if you take a uniform and sample from zero to one, and you plug this into this inverse function over here, you are going to end up with um, some x equal to the logarithm of one minus u over lambda, right? But one minus u is also uniform, so you can simply do the logarithm of e u. Oh, sorry, there is a minus here. The minus u over lambda. Because it is random, right? So it doesn't matter if you are taking one minus this value or the other because with the same probability, we'll be picking up all of them. Okay. 
Another example, for instance, um, more a little bit more complex will be how can I do a, a draw from a 2D Gaussian? And if you remember, we already discussed uh, some of the tricks before. So just to make some uh, quick recap here. Um, when we were when we tried to compute this um, integral over here, like when we try to do the integral of the of the Gaussian, we find out that this is uh, two pi, right? But to compute this, instead of trying to solve this directly, we use some trick of using the the square of this because the uh, non-square version is is harder to to solve. But when you do this, you can then use the trick that this is. Uh, the double integral with respect of x square. Uh, sorry, this is the square, right? x square plus y square over two dx dy. So when when we use this fact over here, um, we can work in polar coordinates, and this makes our problem much much easier. So we're going to do something similar now. Imagine like you are in this. Uh, unitary circle over here and what you are asking is I want to sample this x1, x2 or xy uh, such that it is within the circle and uh, I get uh, some probability over here so these values are in, color, in, in polar coordinates right so this will be the r cosine theta and y cos r cosine theta sorry r sine theta where theta is this angle that I'm finding over here and if we apply this idea that we had before, then uh, the integral, right? The integral of, of my, my, my CDF is actually this, this integral over here. So I, I, maybe I can just call, call it, if I, ca uh, if I take this uh, radius here and I just call it R, I will have my 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 function that depends on r over here and this is the integral right one over two pi of the integral with in x squared plus y squared less than equal to r uh, square of this exponential right e up to minus x squared plus y squared over two dy the uh, dx dy and then we can repeat the process when we're trying to integrate this. So we can do a change of variable, and this will bring us to one over two pi. And then I can just go to co polar coordinates over here. So this will be zero to two pi of d theta, or of the integral of zero to r, of r e minus r square over two dr, right? And this is equal to, I can do this integral over here, and this is going to be pi, uh, sorry, 2 pi, right? So it cancels here. And then I can uh, simply end up with the integral of this part over here. So it's 0 to, uh, and then I, will, I can just do a variable change over here too, right? I can complete my, my differential and then use these so I will have r square over 2 and this is my d e up to du du and this is equal to 1 minus e minus r square over 2 right so I'm just doing this integral over here in terms of the of the color of the polar coordinates and I want to do this because now I have my CDF right and this is nice because now I can do my inverse. So my inverse, or let's call it P, is what? I just need to solve for R over here, right? And this is going to be the square root of minus two log of one minus P. And now that I have my, um, my inverse function, uh, I can see, for instance, that these, if I call this S, I can make some change of variable over here. And this is the square root of 2 log of S, right? Where S is 1 minus P. 
and if I can make, for instance, some other uh, value, let's call it t, between 0 and 1, 2, and s will also go from 0 and 1, then I can define this x as my r cosine theta, that is, uh, that this is r, right? Because I was solving it from here. So this is the root of minus two log of s times my cosine of theta over here. But what is theta, right? Theta is nothing else but some amount of revolution with, with respect of these two pi over here. So if I do two pi times some constant over here, I can do two pi t. And I can do the same thing for y. y is r sine of theta, the root of minus two log s sine of two pi t. And now I can, I can sample from that uh, Gaussian really simple because I can get any point within it as a proxy of finding the, the value of the circle, right? And then I can, I can get those values through two, two uniform uh, numbers because I have the one minus p over here that is just a sample s between zero and one. And I also have one sample of t here between zero and one. So this is a particular example. This was a clever trick that um, people used before to, to obtain it. And there are some reparametrization tricks that you can use when you want to work with different um, samples or di sorry distributions that may not work for all of the of, of all the different things. So the trick with this Monte Carlo inference is how can you define uh, find a way of doing this this sample over here? If you can find your inverse function, then you you are good to go. Or if you can find some region and approximate that distribution. And as long as you have a, a nice approximate, then you can uh, do the sampling and approximate any other function through that. Just be kind of uh, conscious that you are doing approximation on top of approximation on top of approximation. So you will have some error propagation over there that you need to be really kind of clever and, uh, and conscious because if you are not careful enough, that error will just propagate, okay? So this is the introduction to Monte Carlo inferences. We will talk about some other uh, things in the next part, okay?